Good morning. It's Wednesday, the 16th of October, and this is Govind Raj Ethi Raj headquartered and broadcasting as well as streaming from Mumbai, India's financial capital, the Take. Mumbai cars, here we are, have reason to rejoice. The government has, which is the state government, in an evident pre poll move, scrapped the toll for light motor vehicles at five toll plazas into Mumbai from Tuesday night. The current toll is and was around 45 rupees and has been rising steadily over the years. The clamor for removing this toll in itself is not new and has been around for a few years. The toll is collected by a company called MEP Infrastructure, a private company to maintain 27 flyovers in the city of Mumbai and associated infrastructure. The deal was awarded by the Maharashtra Straight Road Development Corporation, MSRDC, which is distinct from the Mumbai Municipal Corporation, which otherwise manages the rest of the roads in the city. And that contract would have expired in two years' time, according to reports. Now, there does seem to be some contractual breach here and thus compensation, which is, of course, a different story. The larger issue is, were people really asking for the toll to be removed? My sense is that as people hated the tolls more for the sheer inconvenience caused in terms of backed up traffic jams and time lost, rather than the 45 rupees paid as toll fees for the upkeep of roads. I'm not saying that the 45 rupees is a small amount of money, but I think the inconvenience was higher. Of course, you would rightly wonder why the quality of roads in Mumbai is so bad if you were paying all these tolls apart from all the other taxes. It's of course useful to remind oneself that this particular toll was not for the whole city and just for the flyovers. Tolls in India are a bane and more for the time lost in idling which is fuel burn in the hands and pockets of millions of motorists driving private or commercial vehicles. There are not many studies on this that I could find but suffice to say that tens of thousands of crores of rupees were once computed as lost because of idling at toll plazas or backed up traffic. Now that figure has quite likely fallen at least in proportional terms over the years as the radio frequency tag system RFID fast tag which kicked in but I'm not sure exactly by how much. But from my own experience, it is common to see backed up toll plazas because either someone does not have a fast tag but enters the fast tag line or they've exhausted their balance and the gate refuses to go up. The reasons could be several, but the delays are common. Arguably, RFID-based systems like EasyPass in countries like the United States work more seamlessly and allow for cars to speed through. That system allows for some leakage is my sense too. In the EasyPass system, if your account is not topped up, then you will get charged later whenever you do, unlike here where you will be and have to be stopped and forced to pay cash, which of course delays everyone behind you. And hence, not having a toll at all is perhaps better than having one. Because while the fast tags fix the problem of revenue leakages, it only marginally solves the problem of ease of throughfare. India's Road Transport Minister Nitin Gadkari has now announced and piloted a new system called the Global Navigation Satellite System or GNSS, a satellite-based road toll collection system which some countries use already, which allows for free travel up to 20 kilometers daily in each direction on national highways and expressways and therefore pay only for the distance traveled rather than the distance between two toll points. The GNSS-based system, which also means no stopping at any toll point, is expected to start in April next year and eventually could replace the fast tag system. So if most vehicles run on this new GNSS system, then quite likely toll plazas will not be needed, at least in the current form. There are lots of other savings there too. The time value of delays incurred on Indian roads has rarely been recognized as it has always been in private hands, whether individual, like I said earlier, or commercial or business. While the disbanding of entry tolls into Mumbai city at various points is a welcome move, there should be an accompanying recognition of the cost of bad and poor roads on people's time, business and lives. And that brings us to the top stories and themes for the day. The markets slip once again. The Hyundai IPO is partly subscribed. Oil slides below $74 a barrel after kissing almost $80 a barrel a few days ago. Why did the Nobel Prize for Economics go to its winners? Is Nariman Point making a comeback? This is a core report with Govindraj Athiraj. The markets slip again. A fresh high on Wall Street did not help the stock markets back home as such or prevented them from falling further. The BSC Sensex and NEC Nifty 50 both rose in the morning to lose their gains later in the day on Tuesday. The Sensex closed down 153 points at 81,092, while the Nifty 50 ended at 25,057, down 71 points. Somewhat predictably in keeping with the frequent divergent theme, the Nifty Small Cap 100 Index and the Nifty Mid Cap 100 Index were up in the positive. China is losing some ground now after the stimulus-triggered euphoria that sends stock prices up in recent days. 
On Tuesday, Chinese stocks fell even as broader Asia-Pacific markets rose following in turn the highs on Wall Street that saw the Dow Jones Industrial Average and S&P 500 hit records on Monday. Mainland China's CSI 300 dropped close to 2.7% to end at 3,855, while the Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index was also down about 3.6% to end at 20,318. China had posted disappointing September trade data after markets closed on Monday with exports rising 2.4% from a year ago and imports adding 0.3%, both sharply missing expectations, according to a report in CNBC. And also remember, back home, there is the Hyundai IPO overhang for that 27,000 crore mega IPO. A report on Money Control said the IPO has received about 16% overall subscription so far. That's as of Tuesday evening with its grey market premium rising now. An earlier report in Business Standard said the company had raised about 8,300 crores from anchor investors on Monday at about 1,960 rupees per share, which is the higher end of the price band. Oil slides again. Oil prices have now fallen, demonstrating once again that the downward pressure on prices are higher than the other way around. This time it fell on reports that Israel may avoid targeting Iran's crude infrastructure, bringing traders' focus back to the International Energy Agency or IEA's expectations of a sizable glut early next year, according to Bloomberg. It's not clear to me whether Israel's promises, if they were made, can be believed since this has not been the way events have progressed in the past. So the more important issue for now is the likely oil market glut in early 2025, according to that IEA warning that came on Tuesday. The agency made small cuts to its demand growth forecast and said that spare capacity in the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries Plus, or OPEC, is near record levels, according to Bloomberg. The Middle East is home to about a third of global oil supply, and the market believes for now that Israel, as we said, will avoid targeting Iran's oil infrastructure, which analysts told Bloomberg removes a big overhang for the oil market in the immediate term. The other downward pressure came from anticipated lower Chinese demand as the company's highly anticipated finance ministry briefing over the weekend lacked specific new incentives to boost consumption in China, which is also the world's largest crude importer. We've been talking about how the markets are disappointed with the package of stimulus measures that China has so far unveiled and wants much more. OPEC, meanwhile, has itself projected weakening demand growth, trimming its forecasts for this year and next for a third consecutive month, according to Bloomberg. An interesting battle for satellite rights. Starlink CEO Elon Musk has said that opting to auction satellite broadband spectrum in India rather than allocating it administratively would be an unprecedented move. Now, satellite broadband, at least to me and from my conversations around, is a small segment of the market and out of the present cost parameters of most users, though it's likely making news more because of who the players are rather than what would be the products they could offer and the price they will charge. Remember that many telecom companies in India have promised 5G coverage in the most remote parts of India already. So it's not clear how satellite broadband could supplement, though it could supplement, but not clear how much. Reliance Industries, which owns Geo, wants Spectrum to be auctioned while Starlink, that's the Elon Musk company, wants it to be allocated administratively, saying that the Spectrum in question has long been designated by the International Telecommunication Union, ITU, as shared satellite Spectrum, advocating that its allocation should be managed rationally, efficiently and economically. Starlink and other global players such as Amazon's Project Kuiper are advocating for administrative allotment, a system where Spectrum is assigned without an auction, and they argue that this method aligns with international best practices and would support the rapid development of satellite broadband services in India. Business Standard is also reporting that Reliance sent a private letter to the TRAI, or the Telecom Regulatory Authority of India, a few days ago, challenging the regulator's positioning and urging a fresh start to the consultation process. Meanwhile, Sunil Bharti Mittal, chairman of Bharti Enterprises, on Tuesday said that potential satellite communication providers must be subject to the same rules as traditional telecom companies. Reliance claimed that TRA had preemptively interpreted Indian laws in favor of administrative allocation without fully consulting the industry. Deloitte had, meanwhile, projected the sector that satellite broadband to grow by 36% annually, reaching an estimated $1.9 billion by 2030, according to that Business Standard report. Reliance results disappoint. Speaking of Reliance, several brokerages have cut earnings estimates for Reliance Industries after the oil-to-telecom conglomerate's quarterly results missed street expectations yet again. 
in the July to September quarter, that's Q2, for the current financial year, according to Business Standard. Some brokerages have also cut Reliance Industries share price targets, factoring in the sluggishness seen in the oil to chemical and retail verticals. And they said that the O2C or the oil to chemical segment is facing headwinds with weak gross refining margin benchmarks and regional petrochemical margins. On Monday, Reliance Industries' consolidated net profit fell about 4.8% year-on-year to about 16,563 crores. Analysts were expecting about 17,200. Reliance's consolidated revenue was at about 2.3 trillion rupees, that's 231,000 crores. The estimate was a little higher at 234,000 crores or 2.34 trillion rupees. Bloomberg analysis says that Reliance has seen a degrowth in net profit for the third straight quarter and this was the sixth quarter in a row where the firm missed brokerages forecast. Reliance's results have of course to be seen in the context of oil prices which have been fluctuating quite sharply which affects margins of downstream businesses as well. Demand scenario for defining has turned bearish over the last few months along with petrochemical margins. Overall O2C Prospects remain tepid for the next 12 to 8 months, according to a note from ICICI Securities. Geo Platforms, which is the telecom side, saw an 18% year-on-year increase in revenue. Though, on the other hand, it's retail, that's Reliance's retail business revenue from operations, dropped 3.5%. So the larger takeaway is not the small drops, but the fact that there is no growth or there is no major growth in Reliance Industries, which in some ways is also reflecting what we're seeing elsewhere in the economy. And presumably, it's tough for Reliance to beat this at this point. Is South Mumbai regaining its mojo? Since we broadcast from Mumbai, we're usually biased towards issues concerning the city. Having started my working life and career in Nariman Point, where India Inc. once effectively ruled the country from, it was sad in some ways to see its decline as offices move towards central Mumbai, Bandra Kurla complex, and then further northwards. There are stories galore about the first moves by advertising agencies from Nariman Point to Upper Worli, a place that actually never existed. Meanwhile, Reliance, who continues to be based in Nariman Point, moved its larger offices to New Mumbai or Navi Mumbai. Over time, rental prices, which had peaked at about 550 in 2007, in Nariman Point started falling. In 2018, rents were quoting at 375 rupees per square feet. In contrast to BKC, that's Bandrakulla Complex, at 833 rupees per square feet, and the National Capital Region, that's around New Delhi, at 460 rupees per square feet. The market for Nariman Point and thus South Mumbai is now changing thanks to better connections, thanks to an almost complete coastal road and an upcoming metro system which should be in place and running by the middle of next year. Top rental prices in Nariman Point have now appreciated to about 569 rupees per square feet by the first half of this year, according to a report from Knight Frank, the real estate consulting firm, adding that between 2018 and now, top rental rates have gone up by 52% significantly outpacing rental growth at BKC where rents have grown by 20%. In contrast, top rentals in Bangalore and the National Capital Region have declined, dropping by about 4 and 7% respectively. I'm not sure you knew that. I for sure did not. This rebound is driven by both an increase in demand for premium office spaces in traditional business districts and upcoming infrastructure projects that are enhancing Nariman Point's connectivity and appeal, says Knight Frank, which is also working on projects in Nariman Point area and has some interest in presenting a good picture, but the rising rents do suggest some shifts. So the question, of course, is, will it be a temporary phenomenon or something more lasting? I spoke with Gulam Zia, Senior Executive Director of Research Advisory and Infrastructure at Knight Frank, and I began by what's changed in Nariman Point. Well, to start with, since we started on South Mumbai or Nariman Point, let me say that I started my career in Nariman Point about 32 years back in a building called Maker Fort. And from there to today, of course, we have seen a lot of churn, a lot of things changing. While in my current organization also, almost about 10 years, I worked in Ballad Estate. So overall, South Mumbai is where I must have spent at least 15 or 15 to 20 odd years of my 33, 34 years old span of career. And in this, something which is very evident that people have vacated the South Mumbai earlier because of a few key reasons. One, of course, it was location-wise infrastructure connectivity was, you know, burdening a lot with a lot of people coming from far off suburbs, etc. was an inconvenience. Then the buildings were archaic, very old plans, very old, you know, facilities, etc. And due to which the biggest issue was compliance. 
quite a few buildings caught fire. Few of the best known buildings in Nariman Point caught fire. In fact, one of the buildings that I was working when I was in Tata Housing earlier, the building caught fire and we had to change to another building. So a lot of those reasons were behind almost kind of evacuation from South Mumbai to other locations in Mumbai. Other business districts were likes of say Lower Parel to start with say Big Force. KPMG was the first one to move to Lower Parel. A lot of them moved to BKC because BKC at that time was constructing swanky new buildings, etc. So there was, you know, a huge amount of that awe to be in a world-class kind of a building. So those who had the money moved to BKC. Those who had a budgetary constraint either moved to Lower Peril or went to Andheri Kurla region. Of course, a few of them even went farther off. Those who would have had their uh, manufacturing facilities but maintaining a small office in Nerevan Point then decided to take their offices also alongside wherever their factories were. So that churn happened for a lot of reasons, I say, in lack of infrastructure, lack of good quality of buildings and so on. And that is what was the key reason for evacuation and these were a few alternatives at that point of time for people to move out and house themselves in different locations. Right. And prices obviously reflected that change because in 2018, according to your report, prices were down to about 375 square feet for lease. But you're saying that now, and the peak was 515 2007. So 2007 to 18 is perhaps at least from a price point of view where the decline took place. But you're saying that now it's on an ascendant and could hit about 569 rupees per square feet this year. So what's going to drive that or what is driving that? A little anecdote. About six months back, I was talking to a very well-known hotelier and developer who relocated his office to South Mumbai. And he stays in Bandra, around Pali Hill. When I asked him a question, why this fall? He said, do you know, Gulam, moving from Pali Hill to BKC takes me 45 minutes and from Pali Hill to South Mumbai takes me 25 minutes with the coastal road and the tunnels, everything ready. Imagine the difference. A few kilometers into BKC, you take 45 minutes to enter. And that is the reason why we thought of understanding what is happening. If a few people are talking about a story like this, what else is going on? So we started checking what's happening in the occupancies of South Mumbai and especially focusing Nariman Point. Started analyzing the data. And that's when we realized that the growth of rent, say a building like Express Star, which is a representative of the best accommodation office building in uh, Nariman Point, the rates have moved, like in last 4-5 years, it has moved by 50-55 odd percent. And then we started comparing it with other business districts and realized that this is the best growth in recent years anywhere in the country. And that's the, exactly the reason why we started pulling the, together all this data to talk about this, which nobody has yet spoken about, which is bouncing back of Nariman Point, revitalization of South Mumbai, you know, complete renaissance of what it was earlier restoring the glory of the old Mumbai and that's what this report is all about going. So now, I mean, demand in some ways I'm assuming is finite for office space or even if it grows, it will grow at a certain pace. Do you see that demand actually coming into Nariman Point because there are other parts of Mumbai, there is fresh demand in let's say Worli, Noor Perel, there's BKC, there's Andheri, there's so many parts which are still pulling. So how does Nariman Point stack up? And of course, this question also, I guess, changes I mean, there is an element of the new coastal road and that changes the dynamics, as you pointed out. Indeed. So, first of all, let me just complete the infrastructure part of it. Do you know there are 11 infrastructure projects which are impacting or connecting Nariman Point with the rest of the city? 11 and more. So, whether it is Atal Setu, which is connecting on Eastern Freeway, Eastern Freeway itself, and Eastern Freeway extension on the way to Mulund is right now under construction. So there are 11 odd projects which are impacting South Mumbai. And that is the key. You know, when I spoke about and when this report came, some naysayers were springing up to their feet saying that rest of the Mumbai is also improving because of infrastructure. Mind you, this is the only place which is impacted by at least 11 infrastructure projects. You talk about Western suburb, two metros, one connectivity here and coastal road there. Not more than two or three in any other location, including BKC. Of course, BKC also has the bullet train coming. But the impact of infrastructure on South Mumbai is the highest. And that is what, now if I talk about demand, since the question was specifically about how is demand panning out. Look, in last couple of years, the office space demand in the whole country has moved up. This year, 
वी आर गोइंग टू सी अबाउट सेवेंटी ऑड प्लस मिलियन स्क्वायर फीट ऑफ फ्रेश ऑफिस सप्लाई ऑब्जॉर्बेशन विच इज ऑलमोस्ट एटीन टू ट्वेंटी परसेंट मोर देन वॉट है लास्ट ईयर एंड दैट इज हैपनिंग प्योरली बिकॉज ऑफ द ग्रोथ ऑफ इंडिया एज एन इकोनॉमी रिक्वायरमेंट ऑफ ऑफिस फॉर इट एंड मुंबई हेज ऑलवेज बीन द फाइनेंशियल सेंटर ऑफ दिस एंटायर ग्रोथ ऑफ इकोनॉमी ऑफ द कंट्री एंड हेल्स द एब्जॉर्बेशन रिक्वायरमेंट ऑफ मुंबई हेज ऑल्सो बीन शूटिंग अप लास्ट ईयर फॉर द फर्स्ट टाइम Mumbai was on 10 million odd square feet, which, on an average, for years to years together, it used to do on an average about five, five and a half million square feet. So there is a huge demand for new office stock, and of course, when we are talking about South Mumbai or Nariman Point, we are not degrading or saying that the others will lose out. There will be business for a BKC, for a Verli, for the rest of them, and there will be enough of uh, demand for Nariman Point also. so let us understand that overall demand for the city exists because of the growth of economy and absolute upper upper end the absolute over luxury creme de creme de la creme would have more than bkc one more location south mumbai with its own heritage its own history its own culture its own lifestyle art and everything which bkc lacks and next couple of years bkc shall suffer because a lot of construction work in any case is going on So overall, we feel there's a strong story for the bounce back of Nariman Boy. Right. And last question, uh, quickly, Gulam. So where is this fresh office stock coming into Nariman Point? In the middle of Nariman Point, opposite the Vidhan Sabha, the Assembly House of Maharashtra, there is a road, Free Press General Mark, on which there is 1.6 million square feet of new development coming up, which is owned by Mumbai Metro. and on top of a metro station they are giving up this property for development and mind you the supply the existing stock of nariman point is barely about 4 million so we are going to add almost one third or more of that existing demand in this one location and that is going to be a key absolute new swanky new building is coming up and mind you rest of the mumbai is also going through a complete makeover but through redevelopment So when a redevelopment is happening in Juhu, Bandra, Ghatkopar, and so on and so forth for a residential property, same is going to happen in Nariman Point as well. Many of these old buildings will be compelled to move and make way for swanky new skyline for two reasons. Number one is, as I said, the rents have increased, which means the values of the property in Nariman Point have shot up almost to the double. And two, FSI. With metro opening up, there is something called as TOD, Transport Oriented Development Corridor, is coming up. So FSI of Nariman Point is already shooting up. So there is a strong reason for the whole of Nariman Nariman Point to undergo redevelopment. Got it, Gulam. Thank you so much for joining me. My pleasure, Goel. Thank you. The Nobel Prize and what it means. The Nobel Memorial Prize in Economics was awarded to Darren Asimoglu, Simon Johnson, and James Robinson for their research into differences in prosperity between nations. The Nobel Committee said that the three awardees have demonstrated the importance of societal institutions for a country's prosperity. Societies with a poor rule of law and institutions that exploit the population do not generate growth or change for the better. And the laureate's research helps us understand why. The award was announced in Stockholm on Monday. Asimo Glue and Johnson work at the MIT that's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology while Robinson is a researcher at the University of Chicago. The question I had was what can we take away from this Nobel Prize and the issues that it highlights not just in India but anywhere in the world and if we could take away something. I reached out to Madan Sabnavis chief economist at the Bank of Baroda and began by asking him about his views on this time's Nobel Prize in economics. So actually the talk of the work which the Nobel laureates have done for which they have been given this particular award see it's based on the fact that there is a lot of inequality which is there across different countries now we're not talking of inequality within the country we're talking of inequality between different countries so essentially what we call the western economies developed economies and the so called emerging economies and developed economies their research has shown that there are basically two factors which have accounted for this kind of disparity and this work has been done over a number of years they're looking at uh, in fact uh, centuries to show that how their theory has really worked so what they've concluded is that there are two factors which determine the pace of growth and the reduction of this gap between the rich countries and the not so rich countries one is the form of governance so i think 
they believe that in case they have democracies, there is a better probability of countries being run in a better manner. And it's more kind of inclusive growth, which we see rather than exploitative growth, which comes when we have an autocrat. So I think here, I think, for example, if we look at some of the African nations, for example, I think they're very rich in minerals, but most of them tend to be run by autocrats. So it is automatically a case of saying that whatever wealth exists in these countries are appropriated by the ruling class, and therefore there is less left for the general public. So that's the reason as to why this inclusive or exploitative things work. The second thing is that, which is very much related to this concept of democracy and autocracy, is that in case we have very strong institutions, then the probability of growth tends to be much faster, much higher than in case they have weak institutions. So what are we referring to institutions? See, essentially, is the rule of law. Do we have a good judicial system? Do we have policies in place which allow business to flourish? So if you remember in the ease of doing business, something which the World Bank used to talk about and has disbanded for quite some time, that actually gives a reflection about how strong institutions are how easy it becomes for people to do business. And when investors are looking to put their money, they would like to look at countries which have these strong institutions. So even in our context, for example, it's something like the IBC, which we had, which is a resolution process, or something which really helps to build investor confidence. So I think these two factors, the, the form of government as well as the strength of institutions are very much strongly related to one another. And that is the, what the differentiating factor when it comes to becoming a very rich country and a not so rich country. Right. The other question is, why would a prize like this or rather this subject be picked up at this point? Is there any reason for this, you feel, in what we see around us? See, I'm not sure if it was planned out this way because even in the past, we have seen that, you know, when Abhijit Banerjee and Esther got the Nobel Prize, it was more on the work on poverty. So it's not always related to economic, uh, I mean, the macroeconomic theory in the sense of you know, talking of financial markets, decision-taking, behavioral economics. So I think this is a fairly, it's a different kind of a subject which has caught the attention of committee. Given the fact that today there is a race to become rich by a number of countries, and that also includes India, since we are talking of becoming a developed economy very soon. So... I think that's where the focus of attention has shifted over how do you actually bridge the gap between the rich and the not-so-rich countries. So, of course, to be clear, we have to say that Nobel laureates don't give you a solution. They only say that if you have a different kind of uh, governance structure and you also have strong institutions, then the path becomes that much easier. It's not a solution they're providing, but yes, it's not prescriptive. But definitely based on their historical analysis, it does show that there is a reason for countries to focus on the institution. Is there any message here for enterprises, firms, individuals, and so on? See, in terms of investment, I think firms will always be looking for countries which provide the right kind of an environment for investment. So I'm saying this because ever since we had the Lehman crisis and we had quantitative easing, there was a lot of funds which were available which were invested in emerging markets. The funds have become a bit more discerning I think there are lots of choice, which is there, number of countries which offer these opportunities. And they will naturally go to countries which provide the best opportunities. So that is as far as foreign investors are concerned. In terms of domestic investors, they don't really have much of a choice, but they would ideally like to work in those sectors where there are fewer controls, where things are more liberal and more transparent. So that's what we have seen, that the moment it comes to anything which could have a lot of regulation, Putting in money as in form of investment is something where, where entrepreneurs think carefully compared to those sectors, like say your IT, for example, where there are fewer curbs which are there. You go there because everything is straight jacketed. So that's what could be the message. Meanwhile, on Monday, inflation numbers outshowed them at about 5.49 or 5.5% for September, the highest level in nine months thanks to high food prices. So much so that Reuters reported several economists now saying they would like to see domestic rate cuts to be pushed back to next year from the early December period, which was earlier anticipated. So instead of a potential rate cut in December, which is really two months away, we are now looking at potential rate cuts next year, or at least that's what some economists would like Inflation stood at 3.65% in August and was above the economist forecast of 5.04. When I say the forecast of 5.04, I mean the forecast for September. 
I asked Madan Sabnavis, since he was with us, about the latest jump in inflation numbers, what was causing it, and what was his outlook ahead? No, I think the inflation number will remain fairly elevated even for the month of October. That's what our forecasts show, that we'll remain in this 5 plus range, 5 to 5.5 percent range in October, primarily on account of horticulture products, that's vegetables and even fruits, where the prices have gone up. But this said, we have seen that even in terms of core inflation, based on personal care products, we have seen the prices have been moving up and inflation has been fairly high. The reason being that input costs have been going up in the past, which were not passed on by the producers. Now they are doing so. So there will be an overall tendency for inflation to remain elevated. And while RBI has forecast that for the third quarter of this year, inflation will be 4.8%, I think it will be slightly higher than that. But definitely far away from the comfort level of the RBI, because they're looking at 4%, targeting inflation of 4%. And for the year, they're looking at 4.5%. Q3 may not provide that kind of uh, space for the NPC to think differently on inflation since the numbers are going to be very high. And given the fact that when they do meet in December, they would only have the knowledge of October inflation, not November inflation, they would actually be talking of the policy with the hindsight of two 5% plus numbers on for CPI inflation. Madan, thank you so much for joining me. That was The Core Report with me, Govindraj Ethiraj. Do stay connected with more of our coverage at The Core. You can check out our website or sign up to our newsletter for our exclusive stories, one in-depth feature a day on www.thecore.in. Do also track us on LinkedIn, where we usually post synopsis or extracts of our top stories and interviews. We would love your feedback on how we can make business more interesting and relevant, including, of course, India's vibrant manufacturing sector. So write to us at feedback at the core.in. And thank you once again for listening.